Hi guys, Squirrel here and welcome to another Derail Valley Simulator video. In this video, we're going to discuss braking. Now I know what you're thinking right now, there's locos in front of us, why don't you discuss those? Don't worry, we'll take a deep dive into each of these locomotives very soon. Today though, I want to discuss braking, which is pretty critical in Derail Valley and indeed it's pretty critical for any form of train operation. So we'll get an overview of how the train braking systems work in general. We can see how we can monitor things from within the cab. We'll learn some tricks on the way and see how things can go wrong. But first, let's head over to the iron mine and discuss the basics. Now in Derail Valley Simulator, there are four types of brakes. The train brake, the independent brake, the dynamic brake and the parking brake. The parking brake is perhaps the simplest thing to understand. You're all aware of what a parking brake is from cars, for example. However, the reasons for them may not be entirely apparent to you if, you're not, if you don't quite understand how braking systems work on trains. And I'll try to sort of clear things up today. Now, the dynamic brake is something that we won't cover today. The dynamic brake we will cover when we look at each locomotive in depth. There's no dynamic brake on the DE2 or on any steam trains, and the way they're implemented varies from loco to loco, depending on how it puts its tractive power down. Today, we're going to take a look at the train brake, the independent brake, and discuss brake, braking systems in general. Now, before we do this, I just want to point out that if you press escape and go to the manual, there's actually a pretty decent uh, section in the manual about braking and how the braking system works, if you want to dig in more depth. Today, I just want to give you a conceptual understanding, enough to basically be a train operator and you understand what you're doing. Now, we know that train brake lines hang off the end of each of the cars. You can see them here. They have this little angle cock. That helps to seal what is inside um, each brake pipe. And the pipe runs the entire length of the train, or the car in this case, pops out, is then connected to the next car, so on and so forth. At the front and back of each locomotive, you've also got uh, the brake lines you can see here. And that basically is how brake pressure is applied down the length of the train. So to kick things off, well, where does the brake pressure come from that flows down this brake line? Well, obviously, it comes from the locomotive. Inside this engine compartment here, there's a compressor. We can hear it when we start locomotive. The compressor compresses the air and puts it inside a tank called the main reservoir. That holds all the air pressure that we need. That is then topped up by the compressor as required. Now, there's a brake lever that is inside the cab there that will release the pressure down through the brake line. And we'll take a look at that in a second. But let's just jump inside and have a look at those two levers. There's actually two braking systems on board a locomotive. There's this one here, which is the train brake. This lever releases brake pressure Sorry, this lever releases pressure from the reservoir and applies it directly to the brakes in just this locomotive. This one here is the train brake, and the train brake will release pressure and send it down that red brake line that runs down the entire length of the train. And we'll discuss how that operates in a moment. However, there's a couple of dials that is present in this D2 that is really telling you what's going on in the braking system. The first one is the main reservoir. This is the pressure inside the main reservoir tank. Now, I've just spawned this train in, so right now there's absolutely no pressure in the main reservoir. We could not release the train brakes at all. This one here on the left is the brake pipe. Now, this is an interesting dial because it tries to show what's going on across two different braking systems. So it can sometimes be a little bit confusing. But notice there's two needles on it. There's a black needle and a red needle. And the black needle basically tells you what is in the brake pipe, the actual hose line, what pressure is in that pipe. And at the moment, there's absolutely none. But curiously, the red line, which is what pressure is being applied to the brakes themselves by the brake cylinders, which we'll talk about in a second, that is on, well, over three and a half bars. So what's all that about? Well, when you spawn the vehicle in, it actually has some pressure applied onto the brakes themselves just to hold it in position. But that will very quickly dissipate. 
And when it dissipates, the brakes are released on the locomotive. So if you actually leave this on a hill and walk away, what will happen is um, after about 20 minutes, that line will come down to nothing as the air just escapes to the atmosphere and the locomotive will slide down a hill. And that's what the handbrake is for. So this lever here, whenever you leave the locomotive, should be put on. If you don't do that, you're taking a risk. This is a mechanical brake. This doesn't rely on air pressure at all. This literally applies the brakes and leaves them on. And you must release this before you drive the locomotive away. So let's switch on the engine and watch what happens. So notice the main reservoir is now starting to pressurize and you can hear the compressor running. You'll hear when it turns off, but also the brake pipe is pressurizing. Now this train is not, well, this locomotive is not connected to any cars yet. So it's just pressurizing the actual pipe, that red pipe that's hanging outside of the loco. And you'll see it stops at three and a half bars approximately, whereas the brake reservoir keeps going. The compressor will keep it between six and eight bar at all times. But listen what happens when it gets to eight bars, the compressor turned off. If it drops below six, the compressor will turn on and bring it back up to eight. And that's how you make sure you've always got some air in order to apply or release the brakes. So let's just quickly operate the loco on its own and see what happens to these needles that are on the brake pipe gauge. So we'll release the train brake, which is this one. And straight away you can see that the pressure in the brake pipe has gone up to five bars and the actual red needle for the brake pressure on the wheel has come down. Okay, so we're not applying brake. The red needle is basically how much pressure are you applying to the brakes themselves? In this case, none. How much pressure is in the brake pipe? Five bars of pressure. Five bars of pressure represents a full release. However, there is a slight oddity to this because that was the train brake which operates on the train of which there is none, whereas this is the independent brake. So what happens if we actually move the independent brake lever, pay particular attention to the red needle. The black one won't move because we're not touching the actual brake pipe. So this is why it's called an independent brake because it works independently of the actual train brake, which is represented by the black needle. This is a direct brake. If you move this lever forward, pressure from the main reservoir goes and applies directly to the brake cylinders and thus the brake blocks on the wheel. Release this, release the brakes, apply this, apply the brakes. It's direct, it's simple to understand, but it's not fail safe. So we'll put it into gear. We'll move forward. And in order to brake with the independent brake, we simply move the lever it applies the brakes and the locomotive stops. Now, you'll notice that we've actually started to use some of the pressure in the main reservoir. It's not been topped up yet because it's not got below six bars, but I'm going to turn the engine off because I actually don't want that main reservoir to be topped up. So I've just applied and released both these levers repeatedly to bring the main reservoir pressure down. Normally, the compressor would bring it up, but in this case, it's now down to just over four bars. Look at the black needle. The black needle is basically showing you the pressure inside the pipe, which is three and a half bars, which is roughly where it should be when the brake is fully applied. However, if we want to release this brake, we will allow pressure out of the main tank into the brake pipe, which is the black needle there. That should come up to five bars, but it can't because the main reservoir isn't that high. It can only come up to as high as the reservoir pressure. The net result of that, look at that red needle. The brakes are not fully released. So what's actually going on under the hood? Well, let's take a little look. So the diagram I'm gonna show you is from the railway technical website, but I'm just gonna start the locomotive up so we can get some pressure back. So this diagram here was on the railway technical website. I'll leave a link to the um, website so you can have a good deep dive on that. But they constructed this diagram. I've 
removed the bottom half and just replaced it with some brown boxes. Each brown box represents one of these cars back here, right? So you can see on the top, you've got the compressor in red. It's providing air pressure to the main reservoir. And then there is the lever, which is these two things here. Or in this case, this one, the train brake, this is the lever it's showing. That lever releases pressure from the reservoir into the train's brake pipe, the blue line. You can see how each car connects via the angle cocks. When you basically move this lever, you are directly releasing pressure from the reservoir into that blue brake line, or when you apply it, you're cutting pressure off. But what effect does that actually have on the cars themselves? Well, let's go and take a quick look at a car. I'll get the little flashlight out here. So, underneath each of these cars, let me just get rid of that for one second. Underneath each car, you can see there's the wheel, and on the wheel is a brake shoe. That's this thing just here. That's the brake shoe. That's what's going to press against that wheel and apply the brake. That is the brake. This is a hinged lever. That's what it hinges off of. This rod, which connects both of those brake shoes, is connected via a piece of rigging to a cylinder. It's called a brake cylinder. The brake cylinder will push this rigging here, which will push that rod and apply both of those brakes. And you can see the whole thing applies on both sets. It doesn't have to, but applies to both sets of these wheels all the way down the train. But what's actually going on? So here's the original diagram, and I'll now reveal the full diagram. That's the full diagram. Now it looks a little bit complicated, but let's just, you know, break it down a little bit. So this is the brake shoe that you can see here. We can't see the brake cylinder itself. It's inside of here, but that's what's coming out of the brake cylinder. That's the rigging coming out of the cylinder. The cylinder is basically a piston with a spring and pressure applies to it. And that pushes this rod down, which applies the brakes. What's the auxiliary reservoir and what is the triple valve? Well, inside of each car, there's a triple valve and auxiliary reservoir. The auxiliary reservoir is a small air tank. Each car has its own little air tank, and that is pressurized when air is pumped down the brake line. That stores air. The triple valve is a clever bit of kit. Well, it's actually quite simple, but it's actually a clever bit of kit because what it can do is help you to release and apply the brakes onto these wheels. Now I'm going to reverse this loco up against these cars and you might see something interesting but not really understand what's going on. But you will in a few minutes time. So why do we even have an auxiliary reservoir and a triple valve, whatever that is, on a car? What's the point of it? Well we already know that this Indy brake here is a direct braking system. By moving this lever we apply pressure directly from the reservoir to the brake. But what happens if we don't have any brake pressure? What happens if the brake pipe has a, has a leak? It has a hole in it or something else goes wrong? Then we have no pressure down the line of the train and we cannot apply the brakes to the cars. Well, that is what the whole point of the triple valve and reservoir is. It's like a mini braking system, which is applied if there's no pressure. So you have to apply pressure to the line to release the brakes. And if you remove the pressure, well, the brakes come on and it uses pressure from the reservoir to do it. Each car will do it independently. Now, when I reverse up to these cars here, I'll just stop my locomotive. You can hopefully see that these cars are rolling. Why are these cars rolling? Why are the brakes not on? Well, the handbrake I've deliberately turned off, okay? There's no handbrake turned on. What's actually happened is these cars have been sat here for a while, so the pressure that's inside the auxiliary reservoir in both cars has bled out to the atmosphere. And because of that, the brakes are released. When the auxiliary reservoir pressure is gone, the brakes are released. There's nothing to apply pressure on these brake pads. And that is the whole point of a handbrake. This is a mechanical brake that we put on a car to stop the whole thing from rolling away. If this was on an incline, this would roll all the way down the yard, which is why you have to put handbrakes on your cars if you're not gonna use them for a while. So we'll now hook this thing up. 
And now we can butt up against it. Because the handbrake is on. We'll quickly connect the brake line. And as soon as we release these angle cocks, pressure will flow from the main reservoir down that brake line. And you can hear it. We'll put the link on. And now we can actually release the handbrake. Because we know that locomotive brake is going to stop this thing from running away. So what actually happened when we hooked all that up? What's going to happen when we actually apply and release the brakes? Well, to understand that, we just need to take a quick look at the triple valve. So, this is the diagram, again, off the uh, Railway Technical website. When, at the top there, when we apply brake pipe pressure, so that, which is what we just did when we applied that, to, when we connected the pipes together, the brake pressure flowed through the valve, which allowed it into the reservoir. At the same time, it allows the brake cylinder down the bottom there to release its pressure through the exhaust. In other words, the pressure from the brake cylinder, if there is any, flows out into the atmosphere, the brakes are released. The auxiliary reservoir is now primed. All of these cars back here are now primed by the auxiliary reservoir. So if we quickly just release the independent brake, we'll see now that we have five bars of brake pressure down the line and our brakes are not applied. If we apply the train brake, what happens is the pressure in the brake pipe is released and that causes the brakes to be applied. But how does it do that? Well, the way it does that is like this. So the pressure comes out of the brake pipe, the valve basically moves over and it allows the auxiliary reservoir pressure from there to flow into the brake cylinder and apply the brakes but here's the cool thing right they won't stay like that forever that auxiliary reservoir cannot hold its pressure indefinitely so if we was to just turn this engine off and walk away those cars would eventually bleed pressure and the brakes would gradually get released if we turn this engine off i guarantee you that red needle would start to fall after about 20 minutes on the whole train. And that's why you do need to put the handbrake on. So I hope that's given you like a basic idea of what is going on inside a train when you apply and release the brakes. Let's quickly end this by doing a couple of little mini tests just to demonstrate some of that stuff. So armed with that information, we can show some cool things. I've pulled the train out of um, the iron mine and I've brought it up on this slope. This is a nice slope here. I'm going to jump inside. As you can see, the train brake is fully applied. The independent brake is fully released. So that means we have three and a half bars of pressure, which is full release in brake pipe world. And you can see the brake is fully applied. I am now going to turn this off. I'm going to leave all the handbrakes completely released. Now, hopefully you understand why this is currently holding its position. It's holding its position because I applied the train brake. When I applied the train brake, I completely pressurized that line, which caused the auxiliary to be isolated and the brake shoes to be released because the brake shoes have vented their pressure into the atmosphere. But the auxiliary reservoir is fully ready to take over at some point if required. Now, what we're going to do is disconnect this rear car. Now, when we do this, something interesting is going to happen. So, first of all, we start by cutting that valve there and cutting that valve there and disconnecting. And then we'll unhook the coupling and we'll just wait a second. Now, there is some residual air pressure still in that brake line, but it's no longer being fed by the main reservoir. It's not pressurized anymore. So it's slowly starting to lose its pressure in the brake line. And if you notice, the car is starting to roll because the brakes, well, they're slightly applied or mostly applied, but not really applied. As the pressure starting to leave the brake line on its own and it's not being put back there by the reservoir, we're starting to actually see the brakes slowly release. And on this slope, the car is now moving. 
Now we can solve this by cut opening this valve. What this valve will do is it release the pressure out that brake line that's still there. And as we know, the auxiliary reservoir will then take over. It will then apply pressure onto the brake shoe. Like so. Just don't forget to close her at the end. So there's now no pressure in that brake pipe and the auxiliary reservoir is now applying all of its pressure onto those shoes, which as we know, won't last forever. But did you know there's also a handle on a car which you can use to basically release the auxiliary reservoir shoe pressure? So if you pull this, it will actually release the pressure inside the auxiliary reservoir, just dump it completely. Then there'll be nothing applying the brakes. And that is something that you can actually use when you're in the yard. If you see like one or two cars on their own, you can just run over to them and pull that lever and it will release the, the brakes. As long as the handbrake's not applied, you can then just push them out the way. Now, that obviously doesn't work too well on a long train where you have to run down the length and release those levers, but it is actually quite a handy thing to know because let me just quickly apply the brake, handbrake. It's a handy thing to know because it be it can be a quick way of just shunting things around the yard. But again, that's now in its starting state effectively. That has no pressure, auxiliary or brake line. It has no way of applying brakes. And this is the only thing stopping it from moving. Now, one thing to bear in mind is the longer the train, the longer the main brake line is. And it takes time for the pressure to flow down that brake line and also to release, which means everything takes more time to apply and release brakes. This is something that you just get used to as a train operator. We're on a 2% gradient here. So we need to be a little bit more clever about how we uh, replace the friction that's currently on the brakes with traction in order to go forward. And we can do that by observing what the red needle's doing and what the train's doing. So we begin on a hill start like this by just applying one notch of power and then we start to release the brakes. And it does take time. On a short train, this will come down. Short train, this will come down quite quickly. But on a long train like this, you can see it's taking time to release. Now I'm detecting a little bit of rear movement, so we bring in another notch of power, and then we start to release the brakes fully. I'm not applying any more power because the brakes aren't fully released yet. We'll just overheat the traction motors. That's pointless. We've caught it with power. We're still moving forward. That's all that matters. And then as the brakes are getting down to the complete release, you start to bring in more power. And if you do this, then you can release the brakes on a hill start without overheating your traction motors or your engine. Now, I just want to demonstrate one final closing point, which is new to Derail Valley, and that is friction is affected by how wet the track is. You can see the rain falling on the track here. I'm going to start this train into motion. We're on downslope, and then I'm going to slam the brakes on. And you're going to see something kind of interesting. And this affects your hill climb as well. You'll need plenty of sand for hill climb when your track is wet. Let's get the power down. Build up a little bit of speed. And as we get around this corner, we're going to slam the brakes on and see what happens. That's the wheel slip. A bit more power down. A little bit more power. More wheel slip. Okay, so train's built up some speed. I'm going to back off on the throttle and I'm going to apply full brakes. And because that track is wet, and you see what's going on, the wheels are quite literally skidding on the track and that's actually damaging the wheels this is expensive and notice even the cars are doing it because they've applied their brakes as well and they can't get enough friction now the wetness is applied gradually as it begins to rain and it takes time when it stops running for the track to actually dry but just bear that in mind for future when you play, play Dero Valley Simulator friction is now a thing particularly in the wet I hope you found this video useful I realize it's quite a long one I have skimmed over a lot of stuff if you want to read more in the in-game in -game manual and also that link in the video description to the Railwell Technical website where you can read all about 
braking systems it is quite in depth but i've just tried to keep it at an understandable level enough so that you can operate the trains well in derail valley that's it from me take care guys happy training